How many of you here this morning have ever read the book or maybe you saw the movie called The Great Escape? Anybody here ever read the book or maybe you're familiar with the story? It is a true story about a group of American soldiers who, during World War II, lost a skirmish with the Germans. They were captured and they were thrown in a prisoner of war camp. Well, the American soldiers weren't there very long when they decided it was their duty and their obligation to try and escape. Well, the men were spread out over three barracks, and they devised this very simple plan. They were going to dig three tunnels that would go from each barrack to somewhere outside of the prison camp grounds. And they worked on this project for months after months. It was a, took them a long time to dig these tunnels. Now, to keep their captors from knowing what they were up to, they gave each tunnel a code name, a nickname. And they named the tunnels Tom Dick and Harry. And every day they would have conversations that would go something like this. Hey, I, I hear Tom's doing well today. Um, I understand Harry, he's not doing so well. I hope he's doing better by Thursday. And again, this went on for months until the day finally arrived when the tunnels were all dug and they were ready to escape. And that night, some 76 soldiers escaped from their prisoner of war camp. Now, can you imagine how happy and excited they were that their plan had finally succeeded? But then imagine their surprise when two days later, the Germans caught up with them, shot some of them, and returned the rest of them to their prison. Now, I'm reading this story, and I'm going, you got to be kidding me. You called this the great escape? Because in my mind, in order for it to be a great escape, you not only have to break free, you need to stay free. Now, here's where I'm going with this this morning. I don't know about you, but maybe you've been a little like me. When there have been times in your life when you've had some bad habit or some sin, and you're stuck in it, and you get free for a little while, and then you fall right back into it, and you get free for a little while, and you fall right back into it, and you feel like you're failing and falling more than you're breaking free. And if that describes you, maybe you've reached a point in your life where you're going, you know what, I just give up. I'm just tired of trying and failing, so I've just, I'm just going to put up with it. And if that's you this morning, maybe you've been a little like me, if that's you, then this morning I would like to talk to you about your great escape. I want to share with you three things you can do to break free and stay free. There are three tunnels I want you to dig today that will help you break free from whatever it is you're stuck in. Now, I want to give these tunnels a nickname, and we're not going to call them Tom, Dick, and Harry. I want to call them Admit, Submit, and commit. And if you would do these three things, if you would commit yourself to doing these three things, I promise you, not only will you break free, but you will stay free. So I want to share this with you this morning, and I want to start with the first one, admit. Now folks, this is very simple. <clears throat> admit simply means you need to admit that you have a problem. Every psychiatrist, psychologist, counselor, self-help guru, and every motivational speaker on the planet will tell you the same thing. If you want to have victory in your life and you want to have successful change, you first need to admit that you need to change, which means you need to admit that you have a problem. Because in life, you cannot defeat it if you're not willing to name it. Now, here's the problem with most of us. We don't like to admit that we have a problem, or most of us will have this tendency to dumb down or play down the seriousness of our problem. And so we'll say things like, oh, it's not sexual immorality, uh, it's a lifestyle choice, uh, I don't have an addiction, uh, I, I, I have a disease, and, and I don't gossip, I'm just, you know, encouragement challenged. Um, I'm not a serial killer, I just happen to have a personality disorder. One of my, by the way, I'm not a serial killer, I promise. Um, one of my favorite cartoons goes something like this. I don't see myself as unsaved, but rather as eternally challenged. We have this tendency to dumb down our problems or to play them down because we have this tendency to not want to accept responsibility for the choices that we make in life. And now, folks, I don't want to disrespect those who actually have a disorder. I have shared with you that I have attention deficit disorder. I have ADD. It genetically runs in my family. And most people, what they don't like about ADDs is that we can be rather energetic and a little hyper. 
And I'm no exception to that rule. But the thing that gets most people with attention deficit disorder is that we have impulse control issues. In other words, if we feel like doing it, if we think it'll be fun, or if we think it'll make us happy, we'll do it without even thinking about it. So I want you to imagine with me that I like chocolate cake. And by the way, I do. I am a huge fan of McCain's frozen chocolate cakes. No, and, you, and I am. I'm a huge fan of those. I love these things. They are garbage, but they taste great. Now, I want you to imagine that um, every other day I eat McCain's chocolate cake. And I don't mean just a piece of cake. I mean I eat the whole cake because I have impulse control issues. So, and I, by the way, I have done this, not every other day, but I have at times sat down and eaten an entire McCain's frozen chocolate cake. But now imagine if I did that every other day. Would you think that might impact my health? Do you think I might develop diabetes or that I might gain some, some weight? Okay, now hang on here though, but, 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 but I'm ADD, I have attention deficit disorder, you're going to tell me that if I eat the cake and I can't help myself, that I'm still going to get sick, I'm going to get diabetes, and I'm still going to get fat, even though I have ADD, is that what you're telling me? Absolutely, because here's what you need to know, you might have a disorder, you might have come from a dysfunctional family, but it doesn't matter because sin doesn't care if you have ADD, OCD, MPD, or whatever D you want. If you're stuck in sin, you need G-O-D because sin doesn't care about your dysfunctional family or your disorder. Every choice you make comes with a consequence, and my ADD does not nullify those consequences. Do you know what I'm saying? Every choice I make impacts me. So I had to learn early on that even though I have ADD, every choice I make, it affects me. And the problem is, is that if I don't name it and own it, if I'm not willing to accept responsibility for the choices I make, I will never break free of those choices and the problems I create for my life. So one of the great truths I've learned in life is this. You can never be free in the future if you're not responsible for your present. In other words, you not only have to accept responsibility, accept and admit that you have a problem, but you need to accept the part you play in creating that problem. Anybody here familiar with a guy by the name of Dr. Phil? Yeah. Dr. Phil was interviewing a lady one day, and the reason she was on his show was because she was in her fourth marriage. And her fourth marriage was on the rocks. And, and she was saying, Dr. Phil, I don't understand what's going wrong here. I've been married four times, and all four marriages have fallen apart. Well, what am I to do? Like, like, what's wrong? And Dr. Phil looked at her, and he said, do you know what all four of your marriages have in common? And he looked at her, and he said, you. Let me ask you something. Um, actually, let me share something with you. If you have problems in your marriage... And problems in your finances, problems at work, problems in your neighborhood, problems wherever you go. Do you know what those problems have in common? You. I love you guys. I love that you talk back. I love that about this church. It really helps. It's encouraging. You are what's in common. And if you are not willing to admit that you have a problem and the part that you're playing in it, you will never overcome it. You need to name it in order to defeat it and the part you've played in it. Now here's how this works its way or plays its way out in Scripture. In our Scripture reading this morning, you may have read that this, you may have been listening to that and following along and thinking, wow, that's a harsh Scripture reading. Here's what Scripture says. What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying the fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, declares the Lord God, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul who sins, it will die. The children of Israel were up to their eyeballs in sin. They were committing adultery, they were worshiping idols, and they were robbing each other blind. And when God called them on their bad behavior, they basically used this proverb to say, it's my parents' fault, it's the way I was raised. And I cannot tell you how often as a pastor and as a counselor, I have met people in their 30s, 
40s, 60s, and 90s who still blame their parents for how their lives turned out. Now, let me be clear. I did grow up in a dysfunctional home. And every single one of you here today, you are the product of how your parents raised you. Let's not negate that. But at some point in life, you have to stop blaming your parents and accept responsibility for your life. And I'll tell you why. Because you can drink yourself blind, but it's not your parents' liver that will die. It will be yours. If you cheat on your spouse, your parents aren't getting a divorce. You are. If you gamble away all your money, your parents aren't going to lose their home. You will. And if you murder somebody, your parents aren't going to jail. You are. At some point, you have to stop blaming your parents and accept responsibility for the decisions you make because they impact you, not your parents. And if you want to break free, then you need to stop blaming other people for your behavior. And what God is saying is you don't get to blame your parents anymore for what they're eating. Go brush your own teeth. <laughs> you follow what God is saying here? Stop blaming mom and dad. You're responsible for your own dental hygiene. And so one of the things I've learned in life is this. Blaming others leaves you in bondage. Do you know what the difference between a victor and a victim is? A victor will accept responsibility for the choices they make and the consequences of those decisions. And if they don't like the consequences, they change the choices. Where a victim will continually blame others for the consequences of the choices that they make. And so if you want to break free this morning... If you want to break free and stay free, then I want to encourage you to admit that you have a problem and the part that you play in creating and continuing that problem. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. I want you to submit. And I want you to submit to the greatest power there is in the universe, and that is the love that God has for you in Christ Jesus. Anybody here ever hear of the 12-step recovery program known as Alcoholics Anonymous? In Alcoholics Anonymous, you may not know this, but it is a Christian program based on biblical principles. And one of the first steps in the 12-step program is we just talk, talked about it. You need to admit that you have a problem. But the second step goes something like this. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us. In other words, the problem is so big, I can't fix it. If I could, I would have. But I'm powerless, so I'm turning to a power greater than myself because I know that God can restore me. And what they're talking about is the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Well, the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous were Bill, no, Bob Smith and Bill Wilson. And Bob and Bill were alcoholics. You want to talk about two guys stuck in an addiction? No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't break free. And whenever they did break free, they would just fall off the wagon. So they'd sober up, fall off the wagon, sober up, and fall off the wagon. And it seemed like they fell off the wagon a lot longer every time they fell off. And both of them, they were friends, they were talking to each other, and they said, if we don't stop drinking, it's going to destroy our lives, our families, and it's going to kill us. And they were desperate, and they didn't know what to do. So they came across this group of Christians, they were known as the Oxford Group. And the Oxford Group took them under their wing. And then they opened up the Word of God, and using the Word of God, they showed them these 12 biblical principles they could use and apply in their life to not only break free, but to stay free. And in 1935, Bob and Bill were so excited about the things that they learned that they started Alcoholics Anonymous. And Alcoholics Anonymous is based around this idea that it requires a greater power than ourselves in order to break free and to stay free. Because here's what you need to know. Jesus did not die to leave you in bondage. Jesus died to set you free. And whomever the Son sets free is free indeed. There are two powers in this universe. This one power died to set you free. His name is Jesus Christ. But there is another power in this universe that wants to break you and leave you in bondage. Do you know his name? 
His name is Satan, and he is committed to your slavery and your bondage. Do you know how they break somebody in a prisoner of war camp? Do you know how they do that? They will take a person, and they will throw them into a small room about the size of a broom closet. There's no toilet, and there's not enough room for a person to even lie down to fall asleep. They feed you bread and water, and every day they will take you out of your cell. They will torture you and then throw you back in your little closet. And this will go on day after day until you reach a point where you don't care if you're going to live or die. And that's when they'll take you out, and they'll sit you down, and they'll say, uh, Oh my goodness, uh, listen, we owe you an apology. We got it wrong. You weren't supposed to be here. Uh, listen, we're going to clean you up. We're going to give you a hot meal. We're going to let you phone your family, and then tomorrow we're going to let you go. And so that night, they give them a shower. They feed them a hot meal. They let them phone their family and friends, and then they put them in a good bed for the night. The next morning, they take them out to the prison gates. They open the gates, and they let the person go. That person doesn't get 200 meters down the road when another group of soldiers grab them, arrest them, and throw them back in that cell. And most people, that's when they break. Satan is no different. He will set a trap for you, and then you get stuck. And you struggle, and you strain, and when you feel like you're ready to give up, he gives you a little freedom. And then you fall, and you're enslaved again. Then when you're ready to give up, he gives you a little freedom. And then you fall and you fail. You get up, you fall and you fail. And Satan keeps this up until you reach a point in your life when you feel as if nothing will ever change for you. You may not know this name, but this man right here, his name is Moshe Rosen. And Moshe Rosen uh, gave his life to Jesus Christ. He's a Jew. And he decided that he wanted to reach other Jews for Jesus. And he started this organization called Jews for Jesus. And in the uh, early 1960s, Moshe was working in downtown Los Angeles. And he was working with people who were living on the streets. And he came across one day this young man. And this young man um, was a, living on the streets. And he was a male prostitute. But not only that, his father was a rabbi. And the reason he was living on the streets is because his father kicked him out of the house because the boy thought he might be, might be gay. And so his father threw him out of the home. And so the boy's living on the streets. He's turning tricks just to eat, just to survive. And Moshe finds him. And every day they got together. And Moshe would pray for him, and he would open up the word of God, and and, and he would tell him about the furious love of God, and and, and that Christ died for him to save him and set him free. And this went on for months. And then one day, Moshe felt impressed by the Holy Spirit to invite this man to accept Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And as the young man sat there listening to this invitation, he thought to himself, my dad hates me because I might be gay but he'll really hate me if I become a Christian. And with that, the young man decided, no, I don't want to become a Christian. My dad hates me enough as it is. A couple of weeks after that, Moshe was invited to move across the country to to work in New York City. And he considered this young man to be the greatest failure of his ministry. Every day, it bothered him. He, he would think to himself, if I had just prayed with him more, if I just read the word of God more, if I just spent more time with that young man, maybe, just maybe, he would have accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior and we could have got him off the streets. It bugged Moshe for 30 years. 30 years later, he's invited back to Los Angeles and he's a guest speaker at a Christian conference. And when he's done speaking on the first day, he steps down off the platform. He's walking towards the back, and this man stands up. He's about 50 years of age, and he cries out, Moshi, Moshi, it's so good to see you. And this man is acting like he's known Moshi all his life. And Moshi is looking at him and going, do I know you? And the man looked at him and said, Moshi, 30 years ago, I was living on the streets. I was a male prostitute. My dad had kicked me out of the home. And you invited me to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And at the time, I said no. 
But Moshe, let me tell you something. The next few years of my life were an absolute living hell. So much so, I, I, I come to understand that if I didn't give my life to Jesus, I was going to die on the streets. So Moshe, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And by the way, Moshe, I want you to meet my wife. We've been married for 25 years. These are my kids and these are my grandbabies. Brothers and sisters, don't you ever allow anybody to tell you you cannot change. Don't you ever allow anybody to tell you that where you are is where you're going to be forever. Don't allow anybody to tell you that your cause is hopeless because whomever the sun sets free, they are free indeed. And all you have to do is admit Admit that you have a problem. Admit that you need Jesus. Submit yourself to the love of God in Christ Jesus. And whomever Jesus sets free, they are free indeed. And so if you want to break free and stay free, admit that you need Jesus. Admit that you have a problem. And then submit yourself to the love of God that sets everybody free in Christ Jesus. And then the last thing I want to encourage you to do is to commit yourself to God's plan for your life. In Romans 12 and verse 2 we read, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. This is the Bible's way of saying, the world has a plan for your life, and God has a plan for your life. The world's plan for your life is bondage to sin, but God's plan for your life is freedom, and the greatest freedom you can have is to be like Jesus and do the will of your Heavenly Father. And what you want to do is understand that the ultimate freedom you can have is to be like Jesus. The ultimate freedom for any human being is to be like Jesus. That's God's plan for your life. That's the first plan. Do you know that? And this plan, by the way, it just doesn't happen in a day. We call it sanctification. And in the spirit of prophecy, Sister White, whom I agree with on this point, and, and I do agree with the sister, that sanctification, this process of becoming like Jesus, is the process of a lifetime. But understand, it is the most freeing process you will ever submit your life to. Amen. The best thing you can do is follow God's plan for your life. I want to finish with one last story. His name is Michael. And Michael is a musician. And as a matter of fact, he's a very gifted and talented musician. Like many people in this church. And Michael one day, he just felt in his teenage years, he felt that he was called by God to become a Christian recording artist. And so at the age of 17, he packed up his bag, grabbed his guitar, and he headed off to Nashville, Tennessee. Well, what he didn't know was that his first years in Nashville would become the most darkest years in his life. You see, he made some new friends in Nashville, and one night they invited him out to a party. And at that party, they pressured him into trying marijuana for the first time in his life. And he did. And he got stoned. And then he went home that night and he fell on his knees and he said, God, I'm so sorry. And Michael said he felt such tremendous guilt that he prayed for half the night. But apparently he wasn't so guilty that it actually stopped him from doing it the next time, and the next time, and the next time, until eventually marijuana wasn't giving him a strong enough buzz, so he started trying LSD. And when that wasn't giving him a strong enough buzz, he started trying, well, cocaine. And during this entire time, God would come along to him and say, Michael, my plan for your life is still for you to become a Christian recording artist. But Michael ignored that voice. Until one night, in 1979, paramedics kicked down the door to his apartment. And when they found him, he was lying on the floor. He was convulsing and he was sobbing. He was crying and he was crying this deep cry. And Michael said afterwards that while he was lying there on the floor, convulsing and crying, he said, it felt as if, as if God had just lit down right beside me and God was crying with me. And he said, it wrecked my world. And he said, so when I was in the hospital during my recovery, I was in my bed and I was praying, please, dear God, save me. God, do whatever it takes to save me. And Lord, from this day forward, I am with everything I have and everything I am, I am now committed to your plan for my life. Lord, I'm going to become a Christian recording artist. A couple of weeks later, he received an offer for 
$200 a week to write Christian songs. Eight months later, he got the privilege of working with recording artists like Amy Grant. And then two years later, he was offered his own recording contract. And if you were to ask him today, Michael W. Smith would tell you that the only way he crawled out of the pit he was in was to admit his need for Jesus, that he had a problem, and he accepted responsibility for his part in that problem. And then he submitted himself to the greatest power there is, the love of God in Christ Jesus, and then he became committed to God's plan for his life. And if you've ever heard Michael W. Smith, you would know that this man has this deep, profound love for Jesus, and he has broken free, and he has stayed free because he has stayed in Jesus. And so maybe some of you here today, you relate to what I've been talking about. You're stuck. You're stuck in some bad habits, you're stuck in some sin, and you want out, but no matter how hard you try, you just can't break free. So can I suggest this morning, admit your need for God. Admit that you have a problem and the part that you play in it. And then submit yourself to the greatest power in the universe there is, which is the love of God for you in Christ Jesus. And then commit yourself to God's plan for your life, which also includes the greatest freedom there is for you to become just like Jesus. And why would you do that? Because whomever the Son sets free is free indeed. And Christian, Jesus is coming. Isn't it time we were all free? Amen. Amen.